speaker, I'd like to welcome Amanda Burris, who's a senior fellow and director of postgraduate programs in evidence-based healthcare at Oxford. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank people for inviting me to speak at this conference, um, not because I have anything profound to say, but because it's been such a privilege listening to what other people have been saying. Uh, in fact, I don't know how well that photo shows. This, this was me when Doug wrote and said, would I mind uh, speaking? I was happy as a pig in mud, but uh, I'm afraid it was pig ignorance too, and I agreed to talk on a topic that I knew nothing about. And so I had to find out. And of course, as everyone knows, when there's a complex problem that the brightest people in the world are struggling to solve, there always comes an idiot who's got the simple solution. And this is my simple solution. What can universities do? Well, we can adopt strategies and processes to ensure that research is of high quality. We can ensure that all the research we do is published and that the publications are complete, transparent, and accurate and that they're published where there's open access, and that they're further disseminated to the relevant people who are making decisions based upon them or going to use them in further research. So it was, um, it was very simple. I wondered what I was actually going to talk about because the solution seemed so simple. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that research is of high quality because we've, had, um, we've got posters out there. We've talked about some of the initiatives for um, guidelines for developing protocols. The only thing that I will say is that um, universities has a, have a responsibility as teachers as well as doers of research. And in fact, we teach all our certificate and diploma health research students, which are mainly in, in the University of Oxford, the academic clinical fellows. We teach them to use reporting guidelines. We teach them, we have a workshop on the equator network. Um, all our students are obliged to all supposed to um, register their protocols before they begin their research dissertations. We encourage everybody to publish, and we've been doing pretty well on it. Um, that all research is published, i just tell you a little anecdote. This is um, a true story. I have irritable bowel syndrome, which is why I popped out just now. And in uh, 2005 at the University of Birmingham, I entered a randomized control trial of funded by Danone of Activia versus a yogurt or deactivated Activia, whatever it was. And this is, this is my intervention. And every five months, when the trial ended in 2005, and every uh, six months or so, I would go on and search for the publication to find out you know, whether it had worked. Finally, I got frustrated, so I wrote to the principal investigator, and this is the email I got back. This trial uh, is not yet in press. This is part due to the much longer than anticipated further analysis at the, uh, of the data at the request of the funders, blah, 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 blah. The difference actually favored the control product. Um, yeah, anyway, it's obviously doing some serious analysis because it's still not in print. Um, so what can universities do to ensure that all research is published? Well, don't enter into any agreements that restrict freedom to publish. And in fact, when I ran a, a group doing these um, health technology assessments for the NICE appraisal process in the United Kingdom, the very first time we did it, I added to the contract that we would have um, the freedom to publish. And they said, so you don't need that, and of course you've got it. Um, but it did get added into the contract. I think we should register protocols of all research, whether funded or unfunded, and that certainly doesn't happen very much, um, ev even if it's only internally. Um, we should include in our protocols a publication and dissemination strategy. Um, the NCCHGA, that's the National Center for Coordinating, uh, Coordination of Health Technology Assessments, they actually started surveying us on what we'd done as a result of these vast monographs that we were producing. And it really brought home to me that just because you've put it out there in public access, it's not sufficient. I think we've actually got a, a responsibility or as individual researchers to actually interpret that and present it to the people who are going to make those decisions. And for example, with the um, Oxygen Cochrane Review that I would co-author of, we actually went and um, 
presented it to the Department of Health, um, to their emergency care. And I think it's important to bring it, if there's an important conclusion, to bring it to the attention of those who need to know. We should audit research conduct, and we could also audit whether people publish. If we've got the protocols, we can have a look whether they published. As far as I know, at the University of Birmingham, and I was there 12 years, nobody once asked me if I'd published research studies that I um, was doing. Not, e not even my line manager. Nobody it was not on anyone's agenda to check that. I suppose they thought that the REA, as it was at the time, the research evaluation um, framework as it is now, would drive us all to do it regardless. But as we all know, the stuff that's not going to be highly prestigious then drops off the agenda. So that all research reports are complete, transparent, and accurate. Um, I've said some of that about putting um, the fact that you sh the protocol should state that the appropriate reporting guideline that's actually going to be used. And I encourage our students who on the dis doing their masters and um, doctorates that to look at those before they start, and then they can make sure they've done the right things. So when it comes to Prisma and did they register their protocol that they did, we're also trying to get them, a lot of people do systematic reviews for their master's dissertations because you don't need ethics approval and all the things that delay you, get them to register it on Prospero. Um, internal peer review of protocols, even when I'm funded. I mean, I ask colleagues to look at what I'm doing and try and engage them in talk, but that's me trying to pick people, brains of better people than I. And there's no formal process where that's done except in some research groups where they, it's part of what they do as a research group. And that's more an initiative by good leaders within the university than something the university requires. And um, encourage and facilitate the making available of supplementary online materials, including data sets where possible. We kept wanting to add stuff. So if we built a model, especially if it was in something simple like Excel, we wanted to put it up there so that other people could change the parameters and see what it wants. And they are, in fact, up on the website in Birmingham, but hidden. Even I have difficulty finding them when I want them, because it was just us sort of forcing it up there rather than anything systematic by the university. Um, that research publications should be open access. I mean, I've always thought this. I thought it was a great idea. And I realized as I Googled to write this uh, presentation that I knew very little about it. Um, this was the um, Budapest Open Access Initiative um, definition of open access, free availability on the public internet, permitting any users to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search, or link to the full text of these articles. And it goes on, the only constraint on reproduction and distribution and the only role of, for copyright in this domain should be given to author, should be to give authors control over the integrity of their work and the right to be properly acknowledged and cited. Um, I kind of treat open access just by abusing any copyright agreements that exist because I feel that the moral imperative to get things into the public domain outweighs <laughs> that. Um, but. Uh, it's worth um, working to this, I think. Um, Bethesda and Berlin both had this um, statement in them. Um, copy, use, distribute, transmit, and display the work publicly, and to make and distribute derivative works in any digital medium for any responsible purpose subject to proper attribution of authorship. So open access removes two really important barriers. One is the cost, stops people coming up against these paywalls. You know, I hate it every time I search for a paper and then the word Elsevier comes up and I think, oh no. And then it, it, you don't have to write for me permission, you, you're just free to use it. So there are two um, levels of open access. The gold, which is open access in peer reviewed journals that anybody anywhere can get. And, do what they like with it, with proper attribution. And then there's green, which is a, a pragmatic alternative where you deposit your research in open access repositories. And they can be external repositories. And, and astrophysicists and maths lead us in that type of thing, or institutional repositories. Um, the gold, what's the problem with the gold um, open access? Well, people say it's cost. You know, what, how can a doctoral student pay this terrible cost? Well, 
perhaps they can't. Um, maybe we need to apply for um, open access um, costs, author costs, when we put in grant applications. Um, 40 universities worldwide have set up special funds to pay when a researcher wants to publish in open access. But the key thing is actually no fee open access journals predominate and I put four surveys there and there are more surveys than that and they come to similar conclusions. Um, this is um, a quote by Peter Suber. I, th I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, the discussion of open access journals has been harmed by a family of false assumptions that all open access journals are fee-based, that all good open access journals must be fee-based, and that author side fees are author fees to be paid by authors out of pocket. Now, I told Doug he shouldn't have invited me to do this talk because I knew nothing about the subject. And I think if you want to invite somebody in the future, you should invite Peter. He is the director of the Harvard Open Access Project. And Harvard, I think, is one of the lead universities that have shown us the way in this modern world, not only with open access publication, but also um, sharing their learning materials freely with other people so people can just go on and do some of the courses that they don't get the qualification, but they get the learning that other um, universities keep hidden. Um, we've had a lot today about same old, same old, documenting all the problems with uh, reporting bias, and sometimes it seems quite depressing. But I actually think this project does give us hope, and that's what they call it. Another thing that w gave me a little bit of hope, I've got, I'm nearly there, um, was the Finch Report published this year in the United Kingdom, and the Finch Report was on accessibility, sustainability, and excellence, how to expand access to research publications. It came up with lots of proposals, recommendations, about 12, but the main ones were very strongly in favour of open access, although with uh, article publication charges <coughs> rather than government-led. And what did the government respond to it? Well, luckily, we're firmly committed to improving access, so the government accepts the proposals in your report. And uh, all public-funded research is, will, in two years' time will be... Um, open access in the United Kingdom. Um, there's some problems with repositories. Um, this is a quote from the report, um, the, the Pinch report. Um, oh no, this is from Elsevier, sorry. Elsevier will allow people to put up post print things on their internal repositories, but they won't allow them to put them up on things such as Archive and PubMed Central. I just want to do one quick survey before I finish. Would you all mind standing up? Would you sit down if you're not associated with a university or academic institution? Right. Sit down if all your research is in open access journals or placed in an open access repository. Uh, sit down if you have placed some of your research in an institutional rep repository. So the rest of you are like me. We're guilty of, um, <laughs> as charged with, and, and most, most universities have institutional repositories. They're growing very, very fast, as are records, but the records are, are lagging behind. And as the Finch report said, um, it's been very little. It's very, been very disappointing so far. Um, there's a campaign to make it mandatory, and there's 250 institutions of one sort or another have. Um, this is the breakdown. These are the UK academic universities where it is mandatory to put your research into uh, your open access repository. Whether that actually makes people do it, I don't know, but one of Ian's harebrained ideas with the Cochrane collaboration, so perhaps his harebrained idea about prosecuting people will also see the light of day. Who knows? Um, and research findings are further disseminated. Um, there are perverse incentives, such as the research evaluation framework, but even that's got an advantage because they've invented this wonderful software so we can all find our research and we can all say how wonderful we are. But actually, you can use that to automatically put your 
documents into an open access repository. This is something my husband always tells me when I complain about him being a misery. It's better Socrates unhappy than a pig happy. And during the process of writing this talk, I signed up to boycott Elsevier. I didn't know you could, but the moment I find out you could, because I really gets on my nerves, I've signed up, as have um, quite a lot of other people. Now it means I can't publish in The Lancet, but I guess it also means I won't have to peer review for them either. Um, so that was the cost of knowledge. I can no longer publish in the, in the um, Lancet. And this is my last slide, because although I put a bit of humor into my talk, this is actually a really serious issue. And if we don't put good research out there that accurately reflects what we know, and we don't allow people to get it wherever they live and use it, we're actually harming the population. We're doing harm. And it's a high cost to ignorance and poor research behavior. Thank you.